to come to the basics of life, spirituality is very much like sexuality in the sense. You are fourteen and suddenly you know. <laughs> suddenly all those little things that meant a world to you as a child, the teddy bear is in the dustbin, you know, the teddy bear goes to the trash can and all the childish games disappear. Now, suddenly you know. In the heart of a lively city, where the sounds of life intermingled in a symphony of chaos, there lived a young woman named Lila. She felt a deep yearning in her heart, a longing for something meaningful in life. Lila learned about a wise man named Sadhguru who spoke about important things like peace and happiness. One day, she gathered the courage to ask him a question. Sadhguru, Lila said, you talk about spirituality and sexuality. Can you explain what that means? Sadhguru smiled kindly and said, Lila, both spirituality and sexuality are about wanting to feel connected. Sexuality is about feeling close to someone physically, and spirituality is about feeling connected to something greater, like the universe. He explained that just like feeling close to someone can make us happy, feeling connected to something greater can bring us peace and joy. But he also warned that if we don't understand these feelings, they can make us unhappy. Lila thought about this. She realized that she had been looking for happiness in things outside herself, like friends and possessions, instead of looking inside. Determined to find true happiness, Lila started doing things like meditation and yoga, which helped her understand herself better. As she learned more, Lila began to see the world differently. She saw beauty and goodness in everything around her, and she felt like she was a part of something much bigger. One day, while meditating, Lila felt a deep sense of peace. She understood what Sadhguru had meant, that both spirituality and sexuality are powerful feelings that can bring us closer to ourselves and to others. Sexuality is like just about anything else in your life. Like in your life, when you're done with one thing, the next thing begins. Just like that. <laughs> when you're done with everything, spiritual process begins. When you like for example, to come to the basics of life, spirituality is very much like sexuality in the sense. You are fourteen and suddenly you know. Suddenly all those little things that meant a world to you as a child, the teddy bear is in the dustbin, you know, the teddy bear goes to the trash can and all the childish games disappear. Now, suddenly you know. Just like that, when a certain awareness arises in you, Suddenly you know that uh, little games don't satisfy you anymore. When you became fourteen, you thought what you were doing till then were petty things. Suddenly you know the big thing. When that big thing becomes a petty thing, now you're spiritual. the so-called big things of life become petty things in your life. Now spirituality arises. There the hormones induce the maturity. 
Here it's only awareness which can induce this maturity. When you have the awareness to see yourself through the various activities of life, the various compulsions of life, the various longings of life, as simply an endless regram role which doesn't really lead you on to anything in particular. You are at it for fifty, sixty years and it doesn't move you an inch from anywhere to anywhere. Either you go through it and realize it on your deathbed or as you begin it or when you are into it, you realize it when you still have time on your hands. So, the spiritual process has to begin somewhere. But the longing to go beyond the limitations in which you live is always there. Every little thing in our lives, when we are into it, it seems like it's everything, isn't it so? Every little thing in our lives, from eating what we want to doing what we want to relationships and all those things, when we are into it, it looks like it's the end all of life. It means so much. If we raise a little above that and look at it, suddenly they all become such petty things, you even wonder why the hell am I in this? So when this question begins to rise, why am I in all these little things stuck like this? Then the spiritual process has begun. Unfortunately for most people, they endure their spirituality unconsciously. I say endure because when you unconsciously seek the highest truth, it's going to put you through all kinds of nonsense in your life. You really have to have a great endurance because it'll put you through the, you know, everything, through a big breakfast to a shopping mall to marriage, through this and that and everything. <laughs> because you are unconsciously seeking some kind of fulfillment. After all, everybody is seeking fulfillment, isn't it? <laughs> Either consciously or unconsciously is the only difference. When we say seeking the truth, see, truth is not a conclusion. Truth is not somewhere you go, it's not a destination. It is just a living experience. You cannot get to truth. You can never get to truth, but you can become truth. If you drop all your nonsense, your truth. If you drop all your limitations, you are that, but you can never get there. It's not a conclusion, it's not a journey, it's not a destination to get to. It is just to become that. If you are willing to see life, experience life beyond all the limitations that you have gathered in the process of life, you are truth. Probably the English word truth creates a whole lot of misunderstanding because if you talk about truth, you'll have to talk about untruth. So the English word truth doesn't really say it. An appropriate word would be, in Sanskrit language, there is something called as Ritambra. called Ritambara, or if one is in that state, it's called Ritambara Pragna. 
one who is aware of Ritambara is Ritambara Prajna. Rit means that which is the foundation of everything. The cosmic basis of life is Rit. Whatever nonsense you believe yourself to be, fundamentally your life, isn't it? Is everybody life? Okay. <laughs> fundamentally you are life. If your life, the basis of life must definitely be somewhere accessible to you, whether it's rooted here or in the sky or in somewhere else, somewhere it must be rooted to that, isn't it? Must be connected. That which is life must always be in touch with the source of what it is. So getting to the very source of who you are is true. It's always there. It is just that it is covered up with the heap that you have gathered in the form of your body and your mind. These two heaps have covered it up. Now the whole effort, every kind of effort that we are doing, either early morning torture that you call as asanas, For those who have never bent their body, those who spent their life on the couch, asanas definitely look like torture, isn't it? <laughs> or the death game of trying to hold your breath. Because holding your breath is death, isn't it? But people claim pranayams are life-enhancing. <laughs> Someone came and told me, you know, this was way back when Isha Foundation was not what it was, what it is today, when it was just a small beginning. So, in India this is unfortunately, where there's a whole age-old tradition of spirituality. When we do samyama, groups of people try to come and stop us. So big arguments, they say, we'll call the police, we'll do this. Why are you doing this? Why are you asking people not to speak? <laughs> you won't believe this, this is in India <laughs> So, one hard shot young man, God gave his mouth to speak, why have you shut it up? I said, your God told you to blabber probably. My God told me to shut up so that he can do that speaking. <laughs> All these things won't get across, you know. Because after all, all they want to do is physically do something to you. It starts verbally. <laughs> Their intentions are very physical. It just starts verbally. <laughs> so, this process of seeking the ultimate, is so simple. At the same time, most human beings on the planet experience, as, experience it as the most complex and impossible process, unfortunately. This is simply because what you're looking for is hidden within you. When I say you, I mean the things that you're identified with right now in your own body, in your own mind, in your own whatever you experience as myself right now. And all that you have gathered in the form of body or in the form of mind, 
always is focused on the outward. Your body is 100% outward, look at this. We've been going through this even in the basic introductories and things like that. Your five sense organs, which is the means through which you experience, are always outward bound, isn't it? You can see what is outside, you can't see what's inside. You can hear what is outside, you can't hear what is inside. You can sense and touch what is outside, you can't touch what is inside. So it is all outward bound. The same is true with your mind. Your mind is equipped only to go out. It is not equipped to go in. People are talking about turning their mind inward. There is no such thing. You cannot turn the mind inward. You can frustrate the mind by trying to turn inward so that it drops dead out of frustration. But you cannot turn the mind inward because the very nature of the mind is outward. It can only go outward. Whether you think about God or you think about soul or you think about truth, you are still looking outward, isn't it? God means up, isn't it? Always. In every culture, God means up. Some cultures look down, that's different. That depends whether you belong to cat culture or dog culture. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Dogs always look up to you. Cats always look down upon you. <laughs> you feed a dog, it looks up to you with gratitude. You feed a cat, it looks down upon you with great disdain. <laughs> this is what you eat? Okay. So, people are either looking up or looking down or looking away because they have no means to look inward. Right now, all the faculties, every aspect of what you know as myself is all outward bound. So when, if the longing has risen within you, that you want to know, you really want to know. I know this wanting to know sometimes bubbles up and again get lost in the daily regram roll. <clears throat> it's… Uh, you know the nature of the mind and the body is such, even the simplest processes of life could be greatly entangling, simple things. Getting up in the morning, turning up the blinds, brushing your teeth, using the toilet, breakfast, if you work, work. <laughs> Whatever, these little things can be highly entangling. From the moment they wake up, to the time they are finishing their breakfast, which is usually just a question of an hour or two, many people are, the, are at the peak of agitation. <laughs> Isn't it so? <laughs> yes? <laughs> Nothing has happened yet, no calamities have struck yet, you haven't met your boss yet, you know <laughs> Nothing has happened. You just saw your wife and your husband or maybe your children, you know all their tricks, isn't it? You've been there, been with them for a few years, you know all their tricks, nothing to surprise you. Isn't it so? Within a few months or, ye or in a year's time, you should know all their tricks that they can play. So, but before reaching the breakfast table or before you get up from the table, people are in a peak of agitation. This is not because there is something wrong with your life, because nothing has gone wrong yet in the day. 
It is simply because that's the nature of the mind. <laughs> if you allow it to rule you, that's how you go, there is no other way. It doesn't matter whether the life situations are going well or not going well. So, if this is the nature of your mind and this is the way life is going on, definitely it's time. Definitely it is an urgent need in everybody that they must look, they must look at the very nature of their life with a much deeper perspective, with a much deeper penetration into it. Isn't it so? The time has come, isn't it? Most people don't realize that the time has come, they think they can do it next year. They think they can do it after two years. There is no such thing. If you value your life, the time has come. Only if you don't value your life, then time hasn't come. If you have any value for this life and this creation, then the time has definitely come that we must look at life with its ultimate perspective. Otherwise, Maybe there is time. Of course, there's a whole eternity ahead of you. There's really no hurry. <clears throat> if the longing arises, the longing genuinely arises in you, really, when your heart cries, wanting to know. When you know the pain of ignorance, when you really know the pain of ignorance, then a master arises. You don't have to look for him because if your longing to know has really picked up a certain intensity within you, if the pain of ignorance has really, you know, really gone deep into you, then he will anyway happen. People, <clears throat> I need to say this. I have initiated more people that I have never physically met than the people that I meet. Because people that you meet physically, <clears throat> there is a disadvantage, there is a handicap. When you handicap is, the other person is also a person like you. He has a body like you, he eats like you, he speaks like you. This is a disadvantage because you can't help judging him, you can't help being protective about yourself, you can't help all those things, you know, the usual things that when you meet a person or a pe people around you. So you are starting with a handicap. This has always happened. Unfortunately, this has always happened. Most of the time, it's only after many spiritual masters, after they have left, the methods and the processes and the teachings picked up momentum. <laughs> when they were there, very rarely it picked up momentum most of the time only after the left because suddenly you don't have to battle with his personality anymore. You know, dead people were always convenient. <laughs> Almost all the time, that is how it has happened. Huge spiritual waves happened after the master is dead, physically dead. Because when he was physically alive, you have problems, problems and problems and problems. It doesn't matter how much experience has been… has happened at many moments. One word that you don't like, one action that you don't like, one something that you think is not okay, a wall arises. <laughs> and. Uh, very few masters have had the freedom to do what they please, whatever they see as right. Otherwise, most other people had to work with the existing…